Hi, Elizabeth here. In this video, we're going to talk about change management in data viz. Have you ever spent hours improving an existing report or graph, and then you share it with your audience, but they ask you for the old version? This is super frustrating, but unfortunately, it is all too common. Understand that while it seems like they might be saying the old way is better, what they're actually saying is the old way is familiar. So in this video, I'm going to share three strategies to help you drive adoption and further build the data viz culture in your organization. Now, for those of you who are new here, welcome to the Storytelling with Data channel, where we share makeovers, tutorials, and tips to help you learn how to more effectively communicate with data. Hope you enjoy. So there's an old saying that the only things that are certain in life are death and taxes. So I would actually argue that there's a third universal truth. People dislike change. And in the case of sharing data in an organizational setting, if people are used to seeing data displayed a certain way, even if there's a more effective manner, they can be resistant to change because this is just a simple reality of human nature. Now, the good news is there are some paths to gaining acceptance for more effective ways of doing things, but it's going to require a little bit of finesse on our part. We have to meet people where they are, particularly if you're facing resistance. So in this video, we'll look at some strategies that we've seen be successful at gaining acceptance for new designs. And I'll talk about each one of the strategies through the lens of a specific example. So here's a table of data. We've all seen something that looks like this. And for the purposes of our discussion here, let's consider this a less than ideal way to visualize this data set. Tables, as you're probably noticing, take a ton of brain power to process. So let's assume this is the table that's frequently shared amongst your organization, and it's constantly refreshed as new data comes in. So people are used to seeing the table like this. But now you found an overarching trend that you think warrants more discussion among stakeholders, but you're getting some pushback in your path to improving the manner in which this data is displayed. This is the way we've always done it. Your leader wants to see it this way. It fits with a broader template that's being used. And if we don't follow this format, we're going to get our wrists slapped. Okay, so it sounds like we're being told that this table, this data must be communicated in a table. So we're gonna have to get a little creative. I'll jump now to our first strategy, which is to improve the existing. So let's not completely throw the baby out with the bathwater and replace what's there, but rather let's look at small minor changes that have major impact to improving the existing and allowing the important stuff to see the light of day. So when I'm faced with this table, there are a lot of things that are competing for my attention that are distracting me from the data itself. Things like the chart border, um, all the heavy lines, the use of color to differentiate the different column headers. We can rethink each one of these things in our design of the table. We want to think about pushing the design to the background when we're communicating with tabular data. And the benefit of doing that is that the data itself will stand out more. So if you noticed, I removed the black borders and the colorful column headers. And we'll talk a little bit more in detail about how we can use color more strategically in a later section. With the borders specifically, we want to use them to improve the legibility of the table. So we can push them to the background either by making them gray or perhaps even removing them all together. And you can start to see how when we do this, the data itself can take center stage. But let's turn our attention to how we can further reduce some of the complexity that still remains. Now, this is a subtle change that I made here, but you notice that I've center aligned the numbers with the currency signal and the column headers. So now I've created clean alignment, making it easier to scan down columns and compare values. Now that we've alleviated some of the work of comparing the values, we can take it a step further and start to introduce some visual cues, such as color that highlight some interesting things. So what you're seeing here is an example of a heat map. This is one way to introduce color more strategically by color coding cells that convey the relative magnitude of the numbers. So we can see here that re wedding revenue for weddings was highest in 2015 and has declined over time. Or that fundraiser revenue is gradually increasing. And we see the same trend happening in offsites. 
Broadly speaking, we can see that across all of our five different event types, revenue varies both by type and over time. We could take the opportunity to actually stake that takeaway in words and put them in a very prominent, prominent place, the title bar. And on the topic of words, we can use annotations to be more specific about our main headline. So notice when I add the words, wet weddings remain mostly consistent while fundraiser, fundraisers and offsites are gradually increasing. It tells you what to look for when you get to the data in the table. So if we're told that we absolutely must use a table, check out the difference with strategy number one. Not completely replace what's there, but rather improve the existing. So by th rethinking how we can use color as a visual cue and adding words to tell our audience where to look in the table, we've improved the existing table. And while this is certainly an improvement, we, you want to take it a step further and make the case for not using a table. How then could we take our audience there? That takes us to our second strategy, which is showing the side by side. And our second strategy builds on our first one, which is not, not to take away what's familiar, but actually pair it with what you're suggesting, which in this case is a graph. Notice how much easier it is to intake this information when it's displayed as a graph. That's because graphs interact with our visual system, which is so much faster at processing information. So a well-designed graph is going to enable that aha in our audience much faster than a well-designed table. That's even more the case when there's an overarching message that our audience might need to understand. For example, that weddings remain mostly consistent, which we can see over time, and that fundraisers and offsites are gradually increasing. So check out the difference in the side-by-side. -side. We could start the conversation with our resistant stakeholders by actually giving them both views paired together to demonstrate the benefits of our improved approach. So now let's look at how we might expand on this, this approach with our third strategy. Now I'll warn you that our third strategy is going to sound a bit familiar to you if you have ever raised a child through the dreaded terrible two stage, and that is to offer choices. So expanding on what we saw in the second strategy, this one, we can pair it with several graphs. So rather than prescribing the improved design, we could offer multiple options and seek input on which will best meet our audience needs. So what you see here are four different ways that we could display the same data set. Now each has its pros and cons, but I could get buy-in from my stakeholders by talking through each one of these four options in greater detail. That conversation might sound something like this. So today I'd like you to consider four different views that we might use to talk through this data here. Uh, with first, let's look at option number one, which is lines displayed by year. With this line graph, we can easily refer to a given event type and track its revenue trend over time. And we can look at a specific year, such as 2020, and compare revenue across our different event types. So for me, this is a view that puts me in the right frame of mind to think about what we might do with this data. But I also want to run you through the other options and get your opinion. So let's shift now to option number two, which is lines displayed by type. We can pretty easily refer to one given type, such as fundraisers, for example, and track its revenue trend over time. One thing we lost compared to our previous view was a sense of comparison by year. So for example, if I asked you to compare 2020 data with this view, you'd have to go to five different places in this graph so these data points are not all lined up in the same place. So what we're trying to estimate is just a harder comparison here. Let's move on now to our third option, which is vertical bars. Now, the benefit here is that everybody knows how to read a bar chart. With this view, we can get an easily sense of the magnitude of the numbers because our eyes are scanning the tops of the bars. And we can get an understanding of how the bars compare to each other because of the consistent baseline, the x-axis. So a downside of this view is just the amount of ink that it takes to get this point across compared to our previous view, which was lines that accomplishes the same thing. Let's move on now to option number four, which is a combination of our line graph and the corresponding data points as a table. 
One benefit of this combined approach that I can easily see for a given trend, I can easily see the given the trend for a given product with the graph. And then if I need more detail, I can refer to the specific numbers with the table. And you'll notice I've taken the, the liberty of highlighting the interesting trends and tying to the details below with similarity of color. So if we opt for this view, I'd recommend we preserve this strategy to alleviate some of the work that our audience has to do to see the different takeaways. For me, one downside of this view is that it's very dense, particularly if we were going to be sharing this slide in a live setting. We'd lose the ability to walk our audience through a story with a progression that builds upon itself, particularly if this is a case where our audience is not familiar with this data or we might be suggesting something that they might be resistant to. We've lost the ability to walk them through and experience the data in the manner in which we want them to. So here are four different ways that we could visualize this data. Each have its pros and cons. Now I'll opt for option one because I think it's the best way to show the data over time, but I'll ask the same of you. Which one would you choose to best enable our audience's understanding? So my conversation might go something like that, where we offer different options and get buy-in involving our stakeholders in the process. We can really use this strategy to our advantage if we use an influential stakeholder who can champion our cause and help influence others. So you've just seen three strategies to help you move your audience towards more effective data communications. If you enjoyed this topic, let me know in the comments below. Or better yet, comment about your experience driving change. Did your audience appreciate the new views? Did they resist the change? We can all learn from each other's experiences. Speaking of learning more, I've had added in a handful of additional resources in the description below. I should also mention that this is a clip from a longer video where I shared even more strategies. So to see the full video, check out our premium library in the Storytelling with Data community. Again, you can find that link in the description. Also, be sure to like this video if you found it helpful and subscribe for even more tips. That's all for today, and I wish you great success in building your data-driven stories. Thanks for tuning in. Mm -hmm.